Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Greta Dietrich, and I live here in Western North Carolina. I've lived here for 15 years now uh, at the headwaters of the Green River, and uh, I'm a medicine maker and an herbalist. Uh, I have a small medicinal herb nursery uh, where I use biodynamic methods and specialize in uh, medicinal herbs and native woodland herbs as well. So this evening we're here to talk about measuring medicine and I would be curious to see how many people here are already making their own medicines. If you could raise your hand if anyone's nice. How many people here are uh, growing their own herbs or wild crafting? Wonderful, that's great. And then how many of you are probably using the folkloric method? Are you familiar with that term? If not, well, you'll learn this evening. Great, wonderful. All right, so we have been using plants, humans here on Earth, for a very, very long time. Our ancestors were, um, much more connected <laughs> to the natural world than we are, and um, much more connected to plants. And in this modern, there's a resurgence, I think, with the herbal, herbal medicine and the herbal community of people that are seeking to re-establish that connection to the green world. For 5,000 years of recorded medicinal history, I have some things up here where they have been integrating plant medicine through the ages. And of course, this really does predate history. Obviously, our ancestors have been eating plants to survive for a very, very long time. Eating plants is an incredible way to get the benefits of it and to get its medicine. Here we have a picture of distillation. It's such a great image. We have a lot of people involved distilling plants. And this is an image from the Hermetic, roughly about 1300 AD, where people really started, uh, the alchemists were really taking plants and actively distilling them to get a stronger concentration. And from this time period, roughly, uh, we start getting higher spirits, um, higher levels of alcohol. So. We are all here tonight to learn about tinctures specifically. And a tincture is concentrated plant extract. And we use a solvent or a menstruum to extract the different constituents from the plant. So you'll hear, these are some terms, some chemistry, some like basic chemistry just to get everyone on the same page that I'll, I'll use often this evening. So a solvent um, is in the medicine making world is referred to often as a menstruum, but they're kind of used interchangeably and it's a liquid substance that dissolves a solute resulting in a solution. All right, so why do we want a tincture? Preservability, tinctures simultaneously, when you put the plant extracts in, are actively extracting these constituents that we want for medicine and preserving it at the same time. So it's a really great way to um, preserve for long periods of time and generally, Tinctures last for years and years, if not decades. And there's some instances where in these old Appalachian hollers, people are finding old mason jars and it's, there's still um, usable properties that are, are still in them. Um, another reason we, we like tinctures, um, and just so you know, and I'm referring to like a tincture right here, this is a, a two ounce dosage bottle. So this is really pretty portable. If you were traveling and um, you wanted to take your medicine, it's kind of a lot to bring everything, so this is really handy to have. Um, your little dosage bottle, and it's discreet. If you keep it in your, in your bag. Um, potency too. Tinctures are highly um, concentrated um, in their medicinal uh, medicine that's within them. And back to the time, uh, the time is to prepare it is 
you just have to take it out and take some drops, put it in some water, and um, it's fairly easy. Uh, the taste, uh, sometimes we have some herbs that are really pretty bitter, and uh, we don't want to sit there. I'm thinking of like a motherwort, if anyone's familiar with <laughs> motherwort tincture uh, or herb, doing a tea and sitting there and having to drink a whole cup is kind of in intense. So sometimes we'll take herbs that have a really strong flavor and put them, um, use them as a tincture. It's a lot easier, um, and especially with children too. Um, it's easier for them to take their, their medicine if they don't have to drink all the, the tea. Um, and traveling is back to the portability. And elimination, you're not sitting there having to drink a whole cup um, of tea, and let's say in the middle of the night you wanted to um, make tea because you were having trouble sleeping, you know, getting up and going to the kitchen and going through the whole process uh, really takes away from the whole point of sleeping. So taking a tincture uh, is really uh, pretty helpful and allows you to sort of just roll over, take your medicine and roll back to sleep. And you're not having to worry about getting up and having to go to the bathroom again later that evening as well. <laughs> okay, examples of menstruums used in tincture making are alcohol, vinegar, and glycerin. So the first one we'll talk about is alcohol. Alcohol tinctures. A lot of people prefer to use the higher percentage or higher proof of alcohol, which we call ethanol, referred to as an ethanol tincture. Um, it's derived from grapes and cane sugar and corn, and it has the longest shelf life of all the alcohols because it's higher in alcohol. It uh, has a, a prolonged preservability. 100 proof, 50% vodka is really the most common and most accessible um, and is used by most home apothecaries. Ethanol is, is really quite expensive, and I put on your handout a place where you can get it, most states, it's illegal. Um, in North Carolina, the highest percentage rate or the proof that we can legally carry is 150. So this is something that you have to special order and it's, it's quite expensive. So a lot of herbalists, you know, you can go and easily get 100 proof vodka or, yeah. And if you're using freshly harvested plant material, you'll want to use a minimum of 100 proof. And this is because, and we'll go into this, the water weight of the fresh plant material. You don't really want to um, go much lower than that. Did you have a question? No, I did buy some vodka recently for making a tincture. When I read the bottle, it made me wonder because it wasn't made from potato. It wasn't made from potatoes. I'm, my understanding is vodka comes from potatoes. Well, this came from, I can't remember what grain, was involved, but it made me wonder if there was a genetic modified uh, concern. Well, they do have organic vodka. That's the good thing. You can get. Oh, it's labeled organic. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Cool. At the at the um, ABC, you can get it. Yep. Yep. You're looking at about a twenty dollar range for about a, a quart or so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're welcome. So let's see, best for extracting resins. Alcohol is really good for extracting resins, uh, such as Balm of Gilead, which is our local poplar. And it's really good for extracting essential oils, such as plants like rosemary and garden sage. Um, and then at the bottom we have brandy and gin. And they are very popular as well. And there's a couple of different reasons people like to use them. One, some people really love the way brandy tastes. Um, it's a little lower in percentage alcohol, um, and so you might want to leave your plants to uh, macerate. We'll learn what that is in a minute, but to sit in the alcohol for a little longer and maybe increase the dosage a little bit. Um, but gin traditionally and brandy have been used for a really long time. Water is another solvent. Along with alcohol, it's a preferred solvent for extracting the broadest range of constituents. Water and vinegar are choice for extracting minerals. They are excellent solvents for herbs that are uh, mucilaginous. 
Examples of that would be a slippery elm, violet leaf, uh, marshmallow, licorice, and there's several more. And plants that are really notorious and well known for their mineral, minerals as stinging nettles. And so for me, personally, I eat them as in the spring and early summer as much as possible. And then secondly, um, I'll harvest them and dry and you make them as an infusion because the water does such an excellent job at pulling out those minerals and that's really what I'm after. Um, so it's my second choice besides it being an excellent food. Um, and then thirdly, for when I don't have it and would like it, I will tincture it. And it's actually one of the herbs that I will be um, working with tonight. It's pretty amazing um, how dark it is <laughs> uh, using, you know, we started with this and it's, it's really quite dark. So there's, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of different constituents that come out of the nettles. Okay, so now we have vinegar. Vinegar is, um, like we had just mentioned, really good for extracting minerals, nettles, chickweed, violets. They're typically made with dry herb, the vinegars, and the reason for that is the water weight. Fresh herbs will dilute the vinegar and they won't last as long. So here, um, I dried some chickweed for this evening so you can see we'll make a vinegar tincture with this. Um, and I use apple cider vinegar, which you can pick up at any supermarket. This is really accessible. All right, now we're on to glycerin. Uh, glycerin is really great for children and elderly or those avoiding alcohol. It was discovered in 1789 and was obtained by hydrolysis of vegetable fats. So it's a byproduct. It's clear and colorless, odorless, and it's very sweet. It's uh, like a really strong, thick syrup. And uh, in my experience with it, it's great for kids. Uh, I really can't get my children to take a regular tincture, but they will um, <laughs> gladly take a glycerin tincture. It has anti-fermentation properties, which aid in the preservation. Uh, the shelf life is about 14 to 24 months. And that's about the same for a vinegar tincture as well. And you can use dried or fresh herb. Okay. So there's two methods I'm going to go over tonight for uh, tincture making. There's the folkloric method, uh, which is really accessible to everybody. There's, there's no math. And basically, you're, you're just chopping your fresh herb or you're using dry herb. And you're placing uh, them in a clean mason jar, covering with a tight lid, uh, and you cover with alcohol. Label and place in a dark place for four to six weeks, and you shake it every day. Really easy. I was just going to exemplify this for you. We'll do some German chamomile. Yes? Um, if I was doing echinacea and I want it for medicine, do I have to take the echinacea root out after <laughs> two months, or can I just leave it in there indefinitely and just let it get stronger and stronger? Well, the whole echinacea plant, which is really exciting, is medicinal. So what I like to do is I'll leave some in to grow. Um, I will, when I, when I take it out, I can divide it and um, kind of put some of it back in and keep some. And then other, I, I'll harvest the stem leaves and flower. Um, and they have really similar constituents on, throughout the plant. Um, so I kind of mix it up so that I'm not taking all of the plant and it can come back. No, I mean uh, the root in the alcohol tincture that's been sitting for two months, do I have to strain the root out or can I just leave it in there for longer than a couple of months? You could leave it in. It's gonna pretty much have done its job at you know six to eight weeks though. I don't think it's, it's not gonna hurt. People leave their herbs and forget about it and they're like, oh my gosh, I forgot about this. It was in the back of my cabinet for a year and you're still fine. <laughs> but 
you know, within the first week or two, most of the constituents are going to be extracted in the alcohol. And the higher up you go in the alcohol, um, that's going to be even more. So if you are making something and you need to siphon off a little bit, um, after a week or two, you can take a little bit off the top and then put it back and finish. It slows down the process um, over time. So it will be a lot of extraction for the first two weeks and then it just kind of slows. So does that answer your question? Okay. So many of you are probably familiar with this method. This is called the folkloric method. So a clean mason jar and I'm filling this up um, about two, I'm going to do a little bit less, about halfway. And then I'm going to take my 100 proof vodka. So when you're doing dried herbs, you put, do about half, but if you're doing fresh herbs, you put a whole jar? Yeah, it's... Well, you'll see, you'll see in the, um, when we do the weight to volume method, which I'll show you next, when you're measuring it, there is different ratios that you use. And you can see um, how that would, that translates back to, you know, this is a dried herb, so you're going to want to cover it and leave a little extra room. The folkloric method is using more of your intuition. It's more forgiving. So here we have it. This is as simple as it is. And we put our lid on. And. Uh, did you use leaves, flowers, roots? This is um, chamomile, just the flowers. Just the flowers here, yep. And so uh, we're gonna get into labeling, but um, I'm gonna wait to make the label on that, but we'll just let that sit. Just so you can get a sense of how easy that is, because you can go home tonight if you have a bottle of you know, vodka or, or gin in your cabinet and, and make. Um, and so this is the same too for fresh. So if I harvested, um, let's say, stinging nettles, um, I would bring it in and you chop it up. Um, you want to chop it up more fine and or put it in your food processor or blender to expose more surface area because um, that will assist in extracting the uh, the chemical constituents as well.